Good morning, everyone. Shall we get started? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me and the music will stop. There we go. Uh, love the music. Uh, I've actually running on the loop for the last uh, 30 minutes, so congratulations to anyone that made it made it through. Uh, my name is Andrew Burridge. I'm a program manager for Northwest ADAS. I'm just going to uh, get us started. Is there a slide that um, should be on the screen? at the moment but it's some just some uh general stuff you can't hear anything can people just pop in the chat if they can hear things i think most people should be able to hear and it should I, mind. I can hear right good stuff I'll, I'll, I'll carry on i'm not sure it's at not oh, brilliant it's a wave of people that can hear uh, we're not sure it's at our end um so i'll just i'll just proceed then so this today's really excited about uh this morning's session uh, inclusion in the workplace focusing upon neuro uh diversity some of the usual housekeeping uh, bits and pieces first so just be aware that we are uh, recording the event and we'll send a link uh with the slides after the event please keep your mics off during the presentations um and and we try and make these as interactive as possible we monitor the chat box and we'll use later on the session but we're also passing um on whatsapp passing questions on to the chair so please do put your comments in the chat box usually pretty uh pretty uh energetic chatting uh, for these events so please share your share your, share your thoughts comments and questions we've now if you see the slide there we just want to say a little bit about the collaborative the organizations that put on uh, these events. So the the masterclass collaborative is made up of five partners across the northwest, representing the NHS, social care, and local government. Uh, and by com combining each organisation's specialisms and contacts, we, we try to we try to provide as innovative expert speakers uh, as as we can to provide cross sector knowledge knowledge sharing for leaders across the northwest. We've been running this for about I think five six years now. There was a period when we were I think way back. A couple of us were looking to book the same speaker in the same month and we had kind of had a light bulb moment to think why don't we why don't we collaborate and try and put on better events uh, so it's been going um going very well for the last few years the five partners include aqua miaa which is merseyside uh, internal audit, audit alliance nhs northwest leadership academy northwest adas and northwest employers Today's agenda, I'm going to hand over in a second to Mark Arbiston, um, the Director of Adult Social Care, Northwest and Kent, Kent County Council, previously of the Northwest, so dead pleased to see Mark again. We've got Lawrence Turner of GMB, and then John Salmon and Holly Sutcliffe sharing their examples. So, excuse me. So thank you, thank you very much. I'll hand over to Mark now and we hope you enjoy the morning. Thank you, Andrew. Can everybody hear me if just one person says yeah, and then I'll, I'll know that my speaker volume is OK? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So I think, as Andrew has said, I'm really excited to be here. I am dialing in from Oldham, which is where I live, so I do very much feel very connected to the Northwest and always will be, as this is where I was born. And... I think I'm going to start with something personal instead of the agenda, because part of the reason why I was particularly keen to chair this particular masterclass is that I myself am neurodivergent and I received my diagnosis at 42 and my diagnosis was both around Asperger's syndrome and ADHD. So one of the things that, you know, I think it's important that when we get into these positions of significant influence that we do tell our story because within our story, there is hope, but there's also that recognition of the fact that conditions are not reasons to act as barriers for people. And I think when we're looking at today, what you're definitely going to hear from as far as I'm concerned, having read the details, is some very fantastic speakers who are going to kind of help you understand why neurodiversity and inclusion in the workforce is important. It's around also recognising that everybody is different because my experience of being neurodiverse is mine and mine alone and it's not, it's not similar to anybody else's. I think it's, you know, it's recognising how do you value people and how do you build on the skills that people bring because our skill sets are very unique and very different. 
and it's how do you build that workforce and the values of having an inclusive workforce that represents the views of the many makes you a much better employer, a more inclusive employer, and ultimately makes us better at serving the communities that we're here to kind of set up. The question we always get asked is, will we get the slides? So I'll buy that one in the bullet now, and I will say, yes, you will get the slide shared at the end of the sessions. And because we are going to work on timescales, recognising the audience that we've got today, we are going to keep to time and we are going to ask people if you can pop your questions in the chat and as well as popping your questions in the chat, if you can also then kind of leave any specific questions till the end, because I am going to ask the guest speakers to stay on at the end if there are any particular questions that you've got from them. So you're going to hear from three separate guest speakers. There's then going to be a chance to go into some breakout spaces so you can have some reflections on what you've heard. And I think we would like to hear about your personal reflections. And then on top of that, it's then around the fact about how we then come back together, get some feedback and questions. I'd also ask that attendees of the session can stay on at the end so that we can get some feedback because I think it's really important that we capture the feedback as you've experienced the session and not kind of wait for some time. So please do do that because a lot of work goes into planning this and there's lots of people that I will thank at the end. So kind of without further ado, our first guest speaker is Lawrence. And I would like to introduce Lawrence, who is the head of research and policy from GMB, which you will know is a trade union. And this represents a wide diversity of workforce across a range of sectors. And specifically for us, it's in the health and social care sector. Lawrence is a trustee of the Dyspraxia Foundation and he leads GMB's Neurodiversity in the Workforce campaign. And I think what you're going to hear from Lawrence today is around the how do we think differently at work? and hopefully some solutions and some kind of guidance into how you can take this back into your work setting. So, Lawrence, if I can kind of hand over to you now and looking very much forward to your presentation. Thank you, Mark, um, and thank you very much to the organisers of today's event. Um, so I think, uh, would it be possible for the slides being shown at the moment to be taken off screen and um, just so that I can share my own? Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully my screen is uh, appearing for you. Um, I won't repeat some of what Mark has said, um, but something that I will just add about the GMB trade unions work in this area is that whilst um, I am myself a neurodivergent worker, um, I'm not so much speaking about my own experience in this session as the policies and experience that has been reflected through the members of GMB who are neurodivergent and who work across a wide range um, of occupations and industries. Um, and we found that there was a increasing demand for support in this area. Now, we'll hear a lot today about the positive sides of neurodiversity how building an inclusive workforce and an inclusive working environment can get the best out of the um, employees in any given setting. But our experience as trade unionists is that far too often neurodiversity in the workforce is spoken about when things reach a difficult point, when perhaps someone is finding out later in life that they might be neurodivergent um, and when reasonable adjustments have not been put in place. And all too often, these issues come to a head late in the process in the form of a capability or disciplinary hearing. And, and at that point, that is a re reflection of failure. Um, and particularly when employers across all sectors, but including 
especially health and social care, are finding it difficult to recruit and retain workers at the moment. And building that more inclusive environment is going to be important for employers, um, but it's also incredibly important for the health and happiness of the people who work in the NHS and in social care. Um, so we produced our campaign and all the support materials that stand behind it through neurodivergent staff and neurodivergent members of the union in close consultation. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the neurodiversity policies and a separate reasonable adjustments passport um, that GMB produced have been adapted by a number of employers and now directly cover more than 25,000 uh, workers. And some of those policies have been taken um, and incorporated into existing equality, diversity and inclusion policies um, by other employers. So uh, the work that we've been doing through the union, which really has come from our neurodivergent members, um, now covers a wider range of workers even than that. Um, so what is neurodiversity and why does it matter? I think it's always important at the start of these sessions, even though if you're joining, you're, you're probably already quite engaged in this subject um, and, and, and might have quite a, a lot of knowledge around it and experience already. I think it's, it is important to try and define the terms that we're using. Um, so neurodiversity uh, is a reframing and it's a positive reframing of conditions such as autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and this list is not comprehensive. And it's redefining those conditions as natural variations that occur across the world and have occurred throughout history in a way that people think and process information with a different balance of advantages and disadvantages to what we might call the typical person. Um, not everyone likes the language of conditions um, and language in this area is something that is always a challenge. I should just say as a trade unionist, I always think of conditions in the sense of terms and conditions. It's quite a neutral word um, to me, but um, just for anyone on the call um, who uh, is wondering why we're using this term, I'm using it deliberately, not in a, in a medical sense. Um, neurodiversity is associated with the social model of disability, um, and this is something which is really at the heart of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Disabled People. Um, it's something that's endorsed by the UK government and the NHS. Um, it is simply the idea that people are disabled by their environment which could be their physical environment, it could be the policies that they work under, um, and that by removing those barriers, um, that we can have a much more inclusive society. Um, between uh, estimates vary, but perhaps between 15, 20% of people may be neurodivergent. Um, so every workplace, every group of service user um, will have neurodivergent workers in it. Each and every person on this call um, will know neurodivergent colleagues um, or maybe neurodivergent themselves, um, even if that is not necessarily always out in the open. Um, and why does it matter as well? As representatives of employers, um, you will all be under legal obligations under the Equality Act 2010, both towards staff and service users. And we'll talk a bit more later in this presentation about some of the implications of those legal protections. And most importantly, and, and I think this is something which Mark has already spoken um, very well about, uh, um, and I think other speakers um, may well be coming on to, um, a workplace that is inclusive in your diversity is going to get the best out of people and benefit from alternative perspectives. I think we're all, we all know now that one of the biggest threats to uh, running any organisation is groupthink. This idea that if you, uh, when you have a group of leaders, or, or not just leaders, but um, people uh, implementing policies. But if everyone comes from the same background and thinks about things in the same way, um, that then alternative perspectives will be excluded and mistakes are much more likely to occur. Um, 
And on the flip side, when a workplace is not inclusive, then everyone lose out, loses out. Um, you don't benefit from those valuable alternative perspectives. Um, it's something of a stereotype to say, for example, that everyone uh, who has uh, an autism diagnosis, for example, is going to be very good at maths. Um, but uh, it is true that um, people who are neuro neurodivergent tend to have a different balance of skills um, to what is typical. Um, and if a workplace is not inclusive, then you won't be benefiting from the full range of those skills and specialisms that neurodivergent workers will bring. Um, and then just finally, if a workplace is not inclusive, then those workplace conflicts uh, and adversarial relationships are much more likely to occur. Everyone loses out through that process, but the workers um, who find themselves on the receiving end of needless capability hearings lose out the most. So getting this stuff right is really very important. I wanted to share this graph um, and uh, just for anyone who's wondering, dyslexia is in inverted commas, not to doubt the, um, the validity of, of the label dyslexia, um, but this is because there is a type of provision which is available through the DWP called Access to Work. And um, this can help to fund workplace adaptations such as provision of assistive technology um, or even provision of support workers. Um, but within their IT system, um, which was set up in the 1990s, there is just one category uh, which covers neurodiversity and that's labeled as dyslexia and it's quite difficult to change. Um, so just with that caveat, I think it demonstrates two things. First, that workplace interest and knowledge of neurodiversity is rising. Um, and we find this from various neurodiversity support organizations, including the Dyspraxia Foundation, which I'm involved in, that where helplines are operated, that there has been a significant increase in recent years um, of people wanting support and advice in relation to neurodiversity at work. Um, so, for example, one thing that we find as a trade union um, is that over the last 10, five years, a number of processes that were previously mainly conducted manually um, uh, or verbally have now been shifted to tablet working and to more standardised IT systems. And that's meant that whether we're talking about engineers and the utilities sector, um, or in some cases, people doing um, call dispatch work are now finding um, that perhaps at the age of in their 40s or 50s, um, the processes that worked for them before um, are no longer doing so. Uh, and people are coming forward and finding that they're needing to seek assessment, diagnosis or advice on dyslexia or other forms of neurodiversity. The other thing which I think this slide just demonstrates is that when it comes to data, um, actually there's quite a lot that we don't know. So this problem of things not being labelled in the most helpful way, that's repeated across a wide range of official statistics. So um, the presentation this morning, um, although my job is in research, it's not going to be very data heavy, um, but it is one area where we know and it's the experience, whether we're talking from the workforce side or the employer side, that this is a significant and growing issue in employment. Um, but what we know in terms of facts and figures is some way behind. But just to share a, a couple more facts and figures, which I think um, I find quite sobering um, and really helps to ground uh, or provide some foreground for why so many neurodivergent workers feel uncomfortable with sharing their experience and their identification with their employers. Um, one survey from uh, three years ago found that fully half of leaders and managers said that they would be uncomfortable with hiring a neuro neurodivergent person um, and a wide range of reasons behind that. Uh, there's perhaps a lack of familiarity, lack of confidence in talking about some of these issues and that's why sessions like today 
are really important. But there is also stigma, there is prejudice, there is a wide variety of um, ideas about neurodiversity, which are not grounded in fact. Um, and uh, on the workforce side, more than half um, of neurodivergent workers said that their workplace was set up in a way that is exclusionary. And then looking back to a slightly older study, um, seven in 10 respondents said that they had experienced discrimination during selection recruitment processes and fully more than 70% said that they do not disclose a condition at that stage because of a fear of discrimination, because of fear that an employer would make an assumption about what they could or could not do, and then make hiring decisions or decisions uh, about progression on that basis. Um, and I can say both from experience within the union and my own personal experience, um, that that fear is not irrational. So we'll just get pause for a moment and give you a couple of minutes to answer a question. This is just put you all on the spot for a moment. Um, we've got a question um, which if you go to slido.com um, and fill in uh, that code. So that is 08. Oh, and uh, I think results coming in already. And we'll just give it a couple of minutes for more people to be able to submit answers. I think there will be another a number of other slider or at least one more slider questions throughout this um, session this morning. So perhaps if you keep the tab open after this, um, that might be a good thing to do. Yeah, so it looks like most responses have come in now um, and uh, looking at just under 30% um, of people uh, saying that neurodiversity is explicitly covered um, in their HR policies and practices. Um, it's not particularly, you know, it's not the most scientific survey, but um, uh, it's a positive results, um, even though we're talking about just under a third compared to um, what the latest information is across the whole of the economy. Um, when in, in a survey five years ago, just one in 10 employers um, said that their policies and practices definitely covered neurodiversity, either through their EDI policies or through having standalone dedicated policies um, and I have to say our experience um, uh, on the trade union side um, was that at that time that figure was probably an overestimate but, but that is from a CIPD survey. So training is really important um, but having proper policies is important as well and we'll talk in a moment about some reasons why that is the case. But just some general points um, which we've learned um, from our own experience and through talking to employers. First of all, stereotypes are not helpful. There's a saying that if you've met one autistic person, then you've met one autistic person. And you can apply exactly the same to one dyslexic person, one ADHD person, one dyspraxic person. Um, some of you might have read uh, or seen the uh, film or play of The Curious Instance of a Dog at the Nighttime um, or the film Rain Man. Um, the film Rain Man was based on a real person who was not autistic. Um, the author of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime later said that the extent of his research on autism um, was to read a couple of articles in the press. A lot of the ideas and stereotypes that we have about uh, what these labels mean um, are based on uh, either misconceptions or some really quite outdated 
ideas of what neurodiversity, uh, what neurodivergent workers can and cannot do. Um, and in fact, there's some good neuroscience behind this now. Um, it's been found that if you put a, the brains of uh, people who have um, a dyslexia or dyspraxia or autism spectrum condition uh, through an MRI scanner, and um, then the, you know, people's brains do look different um, to the typical person in the population, but they all look different in different ways. There is not necessarily a single cause um, behind uh, someone uh, having one of these uh, labels or identifications um, and everyone's experience and balance of uh, requirements and weaknesses and strengths is going to be different. Um, so the uh, advice that we always give is start with the person um, the labels might be useful only to the extent of understanding some general advice uh, and needs, but really starting with someone's individual description, no one is going to know more about what that person requires than the individual themselves. The second point is that insistence on formal diagnosis is can create an adversarial relationship. Um, and this is really important. There are significant cost barriers for an adult to access a uh, assessment diagnosis um, for those uh, uh, conditions for which there is not a publicly funded pathway. So dyslexia, dyspraxia, for example. Um, in theory, people can get a, an individual GP uh, referral. It almost never happens in practice. Um, and for ADHD, where there are NHS pathways in some areas of the country and autism spectrum conditions where there is a national referral pathway, um, there are very significant um, delays uh, in accessing that support. Um, the rate at which people who are referred uh, get a diagnosis at the end of that process vary wildly depending on where you are in the country. Um, and finally, there is a gender bias in those assessment rates. There are still some quite uh, um, long-standing ideas um, amongst even practitioners that some of these conditions are more prevalent in boys and men than they are in girls and women. Um, and we now know that these conditions can present in different ways um, on depending on gender. Um, and it was one of the findings of the LAMI report that people uh, from an ethnic minority background are also much more likely uh, to not receive a diagnosis assessment at school. Um, so there are some very good equalities reasons for not requiring a formal diagnosis or assessment um, before putting a support package in place, before putting reasonable adjustments in place. Um, and uh, this is also something that um, an employment tribunal um, will not necessarily require proof. So best practice across not just the public sector, but increasingly the private sector as well, is not to require a formal diagnosis. Um, and also, many people find it very hard to talk about their experience. Um, a lot of people will have had a very difficult experience at school and later in the workforce, depending on the workplace, for some of the reasons that we've talked about already. So getting good training in place and clear pathways for disclosure are really, really so important um, because otherwise you cannot uh, end up in that situation where something has not been disclosed um, and uh, you end up in that more negative scenario that we we're talking about earlier. And that onus cannot be put um, just on the employee. So just to answer um, a question which, um, again, um, many of you I'm sure will be familiar with, but it's one of the questions that we encounter most commonly in the union. Are neurodivergent conditions treated as disabilities under the Equality Act? Um, and the short answer is not necessarily, but almost certainly. Um, there are very few conditions that are actually listed in the Act 
as automatically uh, things to be treated as disabilities, but neurodivergent conditions are likely to to automatically meet the qualification um, as something that is a long term, so something that is lasted or is likely to last than for more than 12 months, because in almost all cases, these are lifelong conditions um, and the effects of which are more than minor or trivial, um, which is how the requirement for a substantial effect on someone's day to day activities is interpreted. Um, and in fact, the official guidance uh, on this, so this is uh, guidance issued by the government that employment tribunals are required to take into account is clear, even if the language is a little dated, um, that disabilities can arise from a wide range of conditions, um, inclusive of uh, conditions such as uh, autism spectrum conditions, dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, and might as well include ADHD in this list. There are also lesser known duties um, under the Equality Act. So under section 109, um, an employer is liable for all discriminatory acts undertaken by its employees, including managers at all levels of the organization um, in employment matters unless um, the, oh, uh, forgive me, that should read, unless the employer can show that all reasonable steps have been taken to prevent it. So um, if you have a case where a uh, manager at some level of the organization um, is discriminating against neurodivergent uh, employees, um, which could be any of the range of uh, types of discrimination, listed under the Act, so direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, victimization, harassment, it will not be enough for senior management to say, we did not know that this was going on. Because unless that organization has taken all reasonable steps, which, could which can include having clear policies, training, um, uh, routes for uh, neurodivergent workers to report such incidents and haven't taken seriously, um, then your organisation can uh, still be held accountable for that discriminatory conduct. And also under the EHRC, EHRC's statutory code of practice, it is also not enough for an employer to state that they did not know that a worker was disabled. Um, uh, the employer can also be challenged on the grounds that they should have known. So when the duty for to make reasonable adjustments kicks in, for example, and it is a duty, not a right, um, uh, or it's not an entitlement, it is a duty that falls on the employer. Um, if an employer um, has reasonable grounds to think that a worker um, is disabled under the meaning of the act, so that a worker may be dyslexic, dyspraxic, um, then if proactive steps have not been put in place to make reasonable adjustments, um, then unlawful discriminatory conduct can still occur. So again, this goes back to the point of, of that why pathways to disclosure are so important um, because if you are in a situation, and this is one of the most common scenarios that we see where someone is going through capability proceedings um, and then an employer says down the line, we, did, we, we didn't know uh, this is on the worker, they didn't disclose um, that they had a particular condition. Um, first of all, the worker may not know themselves, um, but the employer might be in a better place to say, actually, is there a need for an assessment um, and a bit of support here? Um, or if a worker has not shared that information, um, which might be because they've got good grounds for saying, I don't think that this will be taken seriously, then that does not absolve the employer of their legal liability. Um, so just to say a little bit more about formal diagnosis, and um, this requirement that we sometimes hear, okay, if you want reasonable adjustments, 
give us your piece of paper. And that piece of paper might be something that someone um, had when they were uh, at school. Um, it might be something that they are in the process of acquiring, or it might be something that um, they uh, there is just a cost barrier that is very hard to meet. So a, a dyspraxia um, assessment, for example, um, a private sector dyspraxia assessment can typically cost around £900. And in the midst of a cost of living crisis, and particularly for low paid workers, that is a gap that can be extremely difficult or impossible to bridge. So best practice, as said, is not to require a formal assessment or diagnosis before putting a support package in place. Um, and one of the best employers in the country on these issues is actually GCHQ. Um, we did put in a Freedom of Information Act request at the start of our work to say, can we have a copy um, of your formal policies around this? And we were told that that couldn't be shared because that information was restricted under the Official Secrets Act. Um, so I'm afraid that I can't share um, that wording with you. But actually, there are numerous examples of employers that do this well across both the public and the private sectors. Um, and there are some of the issues uh, with or barriers to it, obtaining a formal diagnosis that are we've talked about already. Um, so when it comes to reasonable adjustments, which is really at the heart of the Equality Act's um, both positive uh, uh, set of actions, but also duties on employers, most of these adjustments are either free or in inexpensive, um, but they offer a very high return on any in in investment. And where funding is uh, an insurmountable barrier, and there are other options available, such as access to work, which again, as a government scheme, does not necessarily require a formal diagnosis um, to be assessed. So um, I won't dwell too long on these because this is not meant as an exhaustive list by any means. We go back to the point that every worker, every neurodivergent worker is going to be different. Um, so starting with the person is always the right thing to do. Um, but uh, some quite simple examples um, are around a sensory environment. Um, many neurodivergent workers process things like heat, sound, touch in ways that are different to most of their co-workers. Um, so having just an environment where perhaps lights can be dimmed slightly um, or heat levels adjusted, or if it's appropriate, perhaps in an office environment to allow um, some employees to wear noise cancelling headphones, just very small adaptations um, along those lines can make all the difference, genuinely all the difference between someone being happy um, and productive at work or in a very unhappy and difficult situation. Um, and the sorts of training that we've talked about um, can also fall under the neurodiversity framework, uh, sorry, under the reasonable adjustments framework. We've, I put here training for managers but in some teams, particularly where there have been issues around inappropriate comments and um, perhaps some discrimination, so excluding some workers from either workplace or um, out of workplace events, putting on training for workers can be appropriate um, as well. And then when it comes to provision of assistive technology where costs do start to kick in, um, again, over the long run, this should be seen as an investment in that person, but also in the collective knowledge um, of the employer and the organisation, um, something that can be reused for other cases. Um, and again, um, there may be some support which could be accessed through the um, Access to Work DWP framework. So um, I'm coming to the end um, of what I wanted to say, um, but just to add a few things um, about the GMB materials. 
Um, we produced a full policy set. So there is there a model set of policies that can and have been either implemented in full um, or which can be adapted, which cover all of the issues that we talked about today, um, including disclosure pathways. Um, the documents include a general set of guidance to dispatch in the workplace. They also include a full legal guide um, which focuses really on the Equality Act and contains numerous examples through from employment tribunal case law. Um, and there is also a specific dyspraxia guide which reflects my background um, through the uh, Dyspraxia Foundation and my own experience. Um, all of our materials have been produced by neurodivergent members of staff in consultation with neurodivergent members of the union. There's a saying, a slogan in the disability rights movement, nothing about us without us, um, which we have tried to um, live uh, in accordance with those values. And it's something as well, which um, I think is important for all employers and campaigners but if you are looking at putting something in place, um, then you will get the best results and build a truly inclusive workforce uh, workplace if you do so in consultation with the workers who will be directly affected. And although we're primarily talking about workers today, um, I think the same applies to service users. Um, so this is just an example from the um, health sector. Um, this campaign started with just one rep, uh, or who, actually she wasn't a, GM, uh, uh, a trade union rep at the time, um, just one worker in a call dispatch role um, who um, found and, and it's suspected for a long time that she may be dyslexic. Um, and uh, because of some changes at work, um, found that she needed some support, including for accessing that formal diagnosis. Um, and the union started by supporting that one individual. Um, but then we found that as soon as we started to talk about this issue in the workplace, um, many more people came forward and said, actually, I'm also in a similar position, or I don't know, but I've always suspected that there's something there, including people quite later in their careers, or people who have a family connection um, to neurodiversity, and said, actually, I, I want to be involved in this, I want to be involved in making a change in the workplace. Um, so uh, just over two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, we negotiated and agreed with the employer that comprehensive set of policy changes which have now been incorporated um, throughout the Southeast Central Ambulance Trust. Um, and just something to say that's really important um, is that this is not just some policy that then sits on a shelf and gathers dust. Um, this has become a living and breathing part of the um, work of that organization. Training for managers um, is being rolled out um, across CCAMS, uh, across uh, NHS, trust um, and on the trade union side um, we have also got much better um, at supporting um, our members and um, again that 15 to 20 percent a huge share of the workforce um, who do think differently at work um, and that's just a photo of our one of our reps uh, Joe and the chief executive um, of the trust when that agreement was signed. Um, and beyond some of the employers where these policies, these GMB policies have been adopted directly, um, we know that they have also been adopted in part um, through, um, uh, so for example, they've been incorporated into some of the civil service policies through the central departments. Um, and just yesterday was in correspondence with an employer in America um, who started to adapt them for the different legal framework um, over there. So all of these materials 
I'll just scroll back. Oh, actually, I'll go down. Um, are free. Um, you are welcome to draw on them. Um, and uh, through GMB's branches um, and officers and local reps, um, we always want to talk to employers about how we can make work better for neurodivergence workers. So all of these slides and links will be shared um, and very happy later in the session to answer any questions or respond to comments um, about some of it, some of this work. Um, I think I've just hit my um, allocated time, so uh, I'll hand back over, but thank you very much for listening. So thank you very much, Lawrence, and absolutely well done for being bang on time. So I think it was just a really kind of interesting and thought provoking discussion. So thank you for that. And I will summarise at the end. So just in terms of next, then we've got John Salmon. And again, if we think about who John is, John's an award winning video executive producer, is a digital pioneer. He's a campaigner, he's a co-founder founder of a branded entertainment agency, Byte Entertainment, and a co-CEO of the Speakers Collective. John is somebody who speaks openly about his dyslexia. He also talks about the shame of his late diagnosis and the realisation that thinking slightly differently has enabled him to have a diverse and successful career that's creative career. John is passionate about sharing his own lived experience of being neurodiverse to support organisations and other individuals in understanding the positive traits of being dyslexic. So I'll stop speaking and I'll hand you over to John. Thank you very much. Hi, Mark. Um, yeah, lovely to be here today and thank you for that introduction. And Lawrence, again, um, an amazing um, presentation to start off with and um, it's great to see all the work that's been done um, with GMB. So I'm going to try and share my screen so that's hopefully technology will um, be kind to me today um, if I remember to click a couple of buttons. So again um, hopefully now you'll be able to see my slides. If you're not then I'm sure somebody will tell me otherwise. So um, yeah, it's great to be here this morning. Um, I'm gonna be talking about being dyslexic, um, how, you know, Lawrence has kind of touched on a number of the areas of kind of how we can support people um, in the workplace to get the best out of, out, out, out of people in the workplace. And I'm gonna focus kind of on my experiences of being dyslexic as maybe a bit of a dyslexic trait. Um, I do a number of different things and sometimes probably um, too many um, kind of juggling sometimes. But yeah, as mentioned, I, I run an agency, Byte Entertainment, and we produce video content and websites um, working with um, different charities and organisations. Um, I'm a member of the Speakers Collective and the co-CEO of um, a group of over 100 um, amazing people that have got lots of different lived experience and we got a community there that supports people that share their lived experience because there's obviously really positive um, things around sharing your lived experience but also it can be quite overwhelming and um, you know it was kind of touched on just there about you know how much how much we decide to disclose and so yeah really proud to be a member of the speakers collective and, and guiding that then a couple of other things I'll just briefly touch on. I'm really proud to be a trustee of a, a char bereavement charity for young people called Let's Talk About Loss. And one of the projects that I've been doing for a number of years um, that's um, called What's Going On Your Head and been exploring using different ways of what's going on up here um, through different events using performance, art, music and poetry. Um, and yeah, again, we've focused a lot of the kind of the people that have been involved in those events ha have neurodiverse kind of qualities and, and backgrounds and yeah my journey I guess talking I, I'm you know being dyslexic I actually you know um well it 
I like talking, but um, also have complete fear as well of um, doing public speaking. But it, it, it has really changed for me in the last few years when I was involved in a campaign called Heads Together. And that was where I shared my lived experience um, around mental health problems I had when I was in my first proper job um, working in the internet when it started off in 1999. And I ended up having a year off work um, after having severe mental health problems um, and there was a lot of shame and stigma that that also went with with, with going through that um, but it was that campaign um, set up by the rules about four five years ago or so that I think was really and again it's about what today is around like collaboration coming together um, and that heads together campaign brought a number of charities together to really tackle head on the, the stigma that exists around um, mental health and as I say kind of touch on it as well about how reframing Lawrence mentioned it as well about trying to to, to focus a bit more on the positive side of um, dyslexia and um, hopefully I'll do that in my talk today so again um, it's wonderful to be here and when we you know talk about dyslexia you know we may have some idea about what it is um, and some stats here from the NHS website that says around one in every 10 people in the UK has some degree of dyslexia only 17 percent of employers have a good understanding of dyslexic thinking skills and challenges there is you know that Slido poll is showing that there is some real progress happening, but it, it's still employers are, are definitely lacking the information that they need to support um, their colleagues. And 82% think that the recruitment process does not enable dyslexics to show their true abilities. I'm notoriously bad when it comes to um, recruitment processes, job application forms, um, I find it a real, a real, real challenge. And um, I still think a lot of people are being excluded even before they've got into the organisation because of the way the recruitment process is structured. Um, and again, we, maybe that's something we can talk about later um, in today's ses session. And technology has been a real enabler um, for me being dyslexic. And so you know, I, I head to Google, um, maybe check GPT now um, a bit more, but, um, you know, so kind of asking dyslex uh, asking Google what dyslexia is, and it, you know, comes quite high up the list. It says that dyslexia is a common learning disability that mainly causes problems with reading, writing and spelling. And as was touched upon earlier, you know, it was like, well, that is part of it, that that can, that can be part of it. but Dyslexia is, is, has some common commonality um, to it, but it, every person is different. So I was kind of Google again, you know, no, no, really tell me what is dyslexia. And, um, you know, for me, dyslexia is so much more than a learning disability and it can affect every aspect of a person's life, how they interact with the world. And I think, you know, that's if you can, I think hopefully the message that we're all going to be able to take away from today is that we're all individuals um and um yeah we need that that we all need the the right support to get the best out of us at work and myself with my dyslexic diagnosis um it didn't come as late as marks um or diagnosis didn't come as late as marks but um for me it was it was still kind of late in my education kind of um at college where I was still being forced to get a maths GCSE C and um yeah just really couldn't couldn't really struggle to get that um and that's when I ended up getting um an assessment done that then found that I, I that I did have dyslexia but I think even at that stage um getting a diagnosis when I did I'd already started to come up with different coping strategies to mask and hide my dyslexia and, and kind of figure out ways around it and some of the things that being dyslexic made me feel at that time so the, this is a picture of when I was working a younger form of myself um 
but yeah, I found exams difficult. You know, I, I thought I was thick. I, you know, didn't do academically at school with GCSEs. You know, I got a handful uh, of GCSEs, but again, very much that education system um, didn't empower me. Um, again, um, it was, you know, the, a lot of reinforcement that I just wasn't um, fitting in within that, that educational system. Um, I was very embarrassed in my hand, handwriting, really bad spelling. Um, I was worried that I'd be found out. Um, I was, again, ha having that label of dyslexia was at least gave me some way of understanding a bit more about myself. And, it, you know, again, I wasn't given really, other than maybe a little bit of extra time for, for exams. Um, there was very, very little and no support um, specifically um, at, at work for, for being dyslexic. Um, but then I didn't, I was too embarrassed to, die, to kind of disclose that at work anyway, because I thought that would, I found myself working in journalism in areas where language and written schools, you know, to be dyslexic almost would be seen as, yeah, definitely, um, barrier to get into those roles if you if, if you disclosed it at the time and a few of the things that I struggle with um today um I, I just go back on that slide I, I am still really bad at spelling but luckily we've got computers um I don't and I, my handwriting is still atrocious um but those thoughts I had around feeling yeah, stupid, um, that my poor memory, again, finding different ways that have enabled me to, to work, um, have, have mitigated those kinds of, those, those kind of feelings of, 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 of doubt in myself. And again, it's different for everybody, but some of the things I struggle with is again, I'm, I'm a real listener. If I'm in a meeting, I'm probably quite quiet. Um, especially if there's a lot going on and I'm really just trying to to take in that information and can find it quite overwhelming when I've got competing or unclear priorities. Um, the long complicated meetings, I think we can all agree um, that, that that can be a real real challenge, especially if there isn't an agenda or, or structure. I, I like to again, just use more kind of voice notes and but when I've got a lot of information in written form again I find it very hard to take take that in we touched on the problems I still don't know um the there and there so a lot of grammar um that I get lost around and I've got two young children who I'm now of ages eight and ten and I think I've I've literally got to wait well they're way past my level now the types of things they're they're learning and i would touch on about ed the education system at the end of my talk but spelling and grammar is a real issue if you were to ask me to write on a flip chart um I, I, it's the last thing i ever do there's something in me that will really i'd really struggle um, and make me quite anxious actually writing things up on on a board and, and uh, on a wall I don't mind reading out loud a bit, especially if I'm planned, but again, very nervous to say I'm kind of more of a listener sometimes within 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 meetings. Um, so not the first to put my hand up. And so when we're looking at dyslexia in the workplace, you know, there's and how as a manager or as an employee or an employer, like what you can do to to help people in the workforce like how can you maybe even you know what some signs for spotting if somebody has dyslexia and again it it can be at times that mismatch between what someone is capable of verbally saying and then their written communication I think I can the masking is quite good sometimes that I can present to somebody or talk to somebody that I, I know what they've said and I can leave that meeting um, and then 10 minutes later 
I, if I haven't written it down, it's completely gone. But the, probably the person managing me thinks, oh, John's got it all in the bag. Um, he's fine. Again, I think where managers have really helped me is that following up with bullet notes and just um, reminders and using technology to kind of break down tasks. Find it hard to, to listen and maintain focus. Um, Lawrence, I was listening um, when you were speaking, but also I was making notes. Um, I was, you know, I was, I was finding that uh, I'm, to maintain that focus for me, it really helps that I'm also doing something as, as well. It's kind of mentioned that it kind of takes longer to process information, but I really think that once I process that information, I can hopefully come back with some some different types of ideas. And yeah, assessment against the clock. Um, any of those, you know, we, uh, I don't think anybody enjoys doing tests, um, but for me, though, this kind of rigid assessment. Um, is, is really difficult, whereas a more kind of coursework or collaborative way of working um, is, is a lot better. And kind of touched on some of the positive side of it, the kind of my brain, I guess, is, is that cri cri critical thinking, um, the creativity. Um, hopefully, you know, I think by through my lived experience, I've got some of that emotional intelligence as well that, um, knows how to to work with people how to how to support them when to push when when to step back i think there's some some real qualities um that sometimes organizations miss is and um, the emotional intelligence um that that individuals can bring to the workforce and five things for every employer to think about is you know is, what can you do to support people that are dyslexic and get the best out of them? You know, think about your workplace might actually prevent dyslexics from doing their best or even actually getting to and join the company. Lawrence mentioned about GCHQ and there's um, a number of different organizations that proactively are now trying to recruit people from neurodivergent backgrounds, including dyslexia they realize the the skills that they can bring um, to an organization and every employee that starts you know you usually get handed a laptop but you know we don't listen and respond to what adjustments need to be made um, it's quite difficult for a lot of people to say that they are dyslexic for the for the reason for the things I've mentioned um, but we should be asking that of every um, person we work with employ about what types of adjustments how 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 can how can we best support your work within this organization and it really is, makes all the difference where I've been able to be my true self um, and with the right support and team you know you, you will see it, dyslexic people become more confident and hopefully bring you know real new opportunities to the organization and things that help dyslexics are actually good for everyone. So it was also mentioned, um, interesting, Lawrence was talking about the reframing of dyslexia. Um, there's been quite a lot of work that's been done in this kind of arena. Um, role models have been incredibly helpful for me um, to see people that have been talking about being dyslexic. I think that's really important to to change the narrative around stigmatized um, labels. Um, and a few years ago, I was asked to do do a video, so I'm going to hopefully this is going to play. Um, and just let me know. So it's a little short sound. There's no sound at the, for for a second or two. But if you can't hear me speaking when I play this video, um, if somebody can just come off mute and I'll I'll, I'll try and reshare it. So um, this is a video I did a couple of years ago, um, around the time of when more positive messages were starting to be put out about um, dyslexia.
the, the work that I've done in the last few years around kind of neurodiversity and again talking and looking what what does an amazing company look like you need a diverse workforce you need different brains you need different ways of thinking getting that that label felt that it was going to be another barrier within the workplace it would be something that would be looked upon as are we better not give that work to John because he's dyslexic. I know through the different projects that I've been involved in, my dyslexia is a superpower. It has given me that creative edge. It has given me the alternate way to looking at it, when, especially where things are like not, not look like they're able to work or if you're up against a brick wall. I realise now that my brain can actually work in a way that's quite solution-based. Yeah, if somebody was to say to me now, would you rather have not have dyslexia? The answer would be no. I'm, you know, I'm very. I realise now that it's a real benefit to have it, and has been a really beneficial within my work. And I just wish that when I was younger, that I'd been assessed and it, that had been found out earlier. So hopefully that played okay and you're able to hear it. Um, and but yeah, the, you know, the, I dropped the word super, superpower in that conversation, and I, I think that's quite a loaded kind of word sometimes um, to use. Um, but also, I think sometimes with our language, when something has been so stigmatized that sometimes you almost have to go to the extreme to to make people think differently um i don't really use the word superpower anymore to describe dyslexia but i but i but you know i think there is it, it does you know start to change the narrative around something that 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 is you know fundamentally i for years thought of just being being and thick and not not very clever so it was it was empowering to me to start to to see dyslexia being talked in that way and some of the kind of the skills and the reason why certain organizations are looking for more kind of dyslexic thinking skills is the ability that some dyslexics have around you know imagining new ideas or reworking of existing ideas and, and thinking of different ways that kind of that imagining and visualizing new concepts and, and ways of working you know that crafting that clear engaging messages you know I guess that's I found myself throughout my career kind of a lot of a lot of change and even though it takes me a long time to write and to form my what I'm thinking um obviously I, I think I've had a little bit of success in 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 getting some of the, those messages across I love connecting um you know joining the dots meeting new people and really trying to find that those those ways to bring people together um and kind of i'm very curious when it comes to kind of exploring new ideas ways of doing things differently um again sometimes a bit too many and um probably take on a little bit bit too much um but i think really you know even though we've got all of these incredible positives to bring um, as individuals to employers and organizations. You know, as I touched on earlier, I was out of work for the best part of the year, and it's hard to know how much was attributed um, to my dyslexia um, in the workplace. Um, but I can tell you that I had in, the, in that job, it was the start of the the internet. It was all very, very exciting, but I was working long hours. I wasn't asking my manager for help when I needed support and probably a combination of some other things that happened in my life that that ended up uh, meaning I was off work for the best part of the year. I was very, very ill with my mental health. And some, you know, research by the British Dyslexic Association looking into anxiety and depression and self-esteem that people with learning difficulties are more likely to experience these types of feelings. Um, so, again, putting support in place for all employees 
is is is, is paramount but specific, specifically those people that are more neurodiverse um and coming back to my kids and the reason that i talk about mental health and dyslexia is is really the shocking stats um, especially after the the pandemic that in 2022 41 percent of pupils completed year six without meeting the expected standards in reading writing and maths i still look at i look at the, the what my children are being taught i'm pretty amazed with how much they are learning but also this over focus on testing and um yeah, this kind of pressure on learning of certain types of things really is skewed towards a certain type of, of person. And I think it's shocking that we've, we're, we're doing these types of exams that potentially, you know, over 50% of people are even at a young age and maybe starting to think kind of negatively about how they're performing within schools. Um, and children from disadvantaged backgrounds, the statistics are even worse, um, nearly 60% than not reaching the expected standard. So I think, yeah, we need to look at what, what the expected standard should be as well. But that's quite a big thing to unpick. Um, and then looking, there was an all party group and discussion looking around um, neurodiversity and and support and, and dyslexia in particular and in that that research some schools were telling parents that their child needs to be at least two years um, behind before they can apply for any support um, which is, is is truly shocking and again sometimes that support could be um, you know support groups again it sometimes support is almost um, can, can be too too big, too late, um, whereas actually some earlier intervention could be a lot less um, and make a real difference. So kind of finishing up with a, a few more slides, just to kind of give a few tips um, around support and five things that you can do to, to help somebody with dyslexia. You know, really understand what dyslexia means for that person. Every dyslexic person is, is is different just like we all are on this um call today um encouragement and support is incredibly helpful um for somebody with dyslexia i think we all need a cheerleader um, but when you've got those negative thoughts when it's taking you a lot longer to to pull things together there is a real fierce critic definitely in me um that's very judgmental and just those words of encouragement and support truly make a difference um, to me and I think to quite a lot of people that are dyslexic. Again, a language, lazy, careless, scatty, you know, I've been called them all and um, forgetful and, you know, words that reinforce these negative stereotypes are really best avoided. And I love looking at like the, the bigger picture. And I think it's, you know, it's looking at where people with more dyslexic traits fit within your organization. Um, I love looking at the big picture, coming up with new ideas. Um, and um, that's why we come to work, isn't it? To, to, to hopefully to bring that each day. And even though I've been using quite a lot of text <laughs> in these slides for me when it comes to, to taking on information um yeah using less text and bullets and summaries is really really helpful and lawrence kind of picked up on it you know there's lots of ways that you can put reasonable adjustments in place within the workplace and um, this can be around you know technology really um if i was born 20 years earlier i'd be doing a very different job but technology has really enabled me um, with my spelling, with my writing, with the ability to write something or to do a voice note and move things around the page, you know, making sure that you've got the technology in place that that supports everyone, um, particularly those with, who are dyslexic, to be able to get their thoughts 
um, out of their head um, in the way that works for them. Talked about environment and how that can really impact on somebody who's dyslexic and, 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 and finding spaces within the, the office that works. Um, yeah, and just trying to, you know, really just li listen to what, what that, that person needs to get the best support within the organisation. So thank you very much for listening to me talk. Um, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A later. Um, it's good to know where to get help to find out some more information. There's a number of different places if you're looking to get an assessment. You've got the British Dyslexic Dyslexia Association. Um, that's where I got my uh, assessment. Um, made by Dyslexia, really pushing the they're really pushing the narrative of the positive side of of dyslexia. Um, and another brilliant Instagram account and, and website is Dyslexia and Adults. Again, we you know we've talked about how difficult it is. Um, in young people um, for diagnosis, but I think definitely when it comes to adults, we've, we've masked a, a lot of some of our dyslexic traits or we kind of hide them. And um, yeah, that Natalie who runs Dyslexia in Adults really, you know, I think gets a good balance between the, the benefits and the, the challenges of, of having dyslexia. So thank you very much um, for listening. Um, it's been yeah, wonderful to talk um, today. And I think I'm now going to hand back to Mark. Thank you, John. And another, uh, you know, very different, which I suppose is part of the purpose of today, but really near me, because my internet's yeah, playing. All here, yeah. Brilliant. So fantastic. Obviously, massively inspiring, but I think equally you captured a lot of the challenges that can go on below the surface that people don't see. So just thank you and look forward to the questions later. So just bringing us to our final guest speaker before we get a chance to go into some breakout rooms. And I'm going to introduce Holly now, Holly, Holly Sutcliffe. So Holly is a neurodivergent mental health advocate. Holly works with individuals, families, and institutions as an integrated holistic coach. As a late diagnosed autistic human, Holly finalized why and how she'd struggled for so long to live a full life. And now Holly embraces her version of full life, which, which looks totally different to a neurotypical one. And she embraces the joyful, conscious, heartfelt life she now lives with her daughter by the sea. So enough from me. I'll hand you up back over to Holly now and I'll turn my camera off because my internet is struggling. Hello. Um, thank you to everybody. Um, if you haven't taken a movement, you've been sitting down, I'm just going to invite you to do that because I've had my camera off intentionally and I have been uh, stimming all over my house basically whilst also listening. So it's a beautiful, um, I just wanna really highlight the fact how lovely it is that the chair and all the other speakers are neurodivergent because I think that's a really important part of uh, connection. And it really, yeah, makes me feel even more accepted and included just to know that everybody on the panel is neurodivergent. Um, I've said, very specifically that this is my experience that I'm gonna talk about. Um, autism is a spectrum and um, not everybody is on the spectrum. The amount of times I've heard people say, well, everyone's a little bit on the spectrum. No, 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 autism is a thing if you're either autistic or you're not. And I think it's really important to recognize that because I think in, in, in not acknowledging that, uh, it sort of belittles the experience and the challenges it, that we face as autistic people. Um, if we can have a next slide. So I am, I put parent carer at first because that is my most important role that I play. Um, I found out I was autistic because my daughter is autistic. And when we were putting things in place to help and support her, 
it was helping me and it was a real light bulb moment for me to understand finally at the age of 38 why I had struggled oh what someone just asked what's stim so stim is um basically moving that helps you regulate so it's kind of be twitching uh moving your face fiddling with your hair jumping up and down yeah so sorry i just please do clarify anything yeah so stimming is just basically is a way to regulate because one of the key things that threads its way through the autistic experience is a difficult with regulating the emotions and the emotional experience through sensory processing so stimming has been one of my saving graces um so yes yeah, so i'm a late discovered autistic i also have got ptsd which is part of my neurodivergent identity i don't talk about my ptsd as much because it's not as nice to talk about um but yeah it is part of my neurodivergent identity and i feel quite strongly about that i'm an educator as i'm going to talk about later on in this presentation my background is as a secondary school english teacher that didn't work out for me for some some very clear reasons um so i still class myself as, as an educator i'm a neurodivergent advocate i do that in lots of ways primarily for my daughter in school i know in the chat there's been lots of mention about you know things in education and yeah it, it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot to try and get your kids to be accommodated in the ways that they need to be but and really it's amazing that we're all here today talking about in the workplace but really, you know, I think we can all acknowledge that, you know, if we start at age two, three, four, five with accommodating neurodivergent people, their life expectancy, their work expectancy, their contributions to society and their, their happiness and fulfillment in their life is going to be much greater. Um, I'm a yoga teacher and a somatic therapist. I don't know how I manage to do all of these things. I just do little bits of all of them, basically. <laughs> um, and I've just recently, with a bunch of neurodivergent people here in Margate, set up um, neurodivergent friends in Thanet um, Community Interest Company, which we run social meetups and are going to move into doing creative uh, programming for the neurodivergent community. So it's going to be 100% community um, informed in practice. So that's who I am. So we'll move on to the next slide, which is a very specific. It was funny. I got something wrong in the chat about um, language because I'm my background is, is English. I did English degree. I've been an English teacher and there's a lot of confusion around the language. And I just always like to start with acknowledging that society is neurodiverse. A, a human being can't really be neurodiverse because it's a sort of a uh, generalized term individuals can be neurodivergent or they can be neurotypical so i have an inherited genetic um neurodivergent trait i'm autistic i'm also on the the wait list for an assessment for adhd i also have acquired a neurodivergent trait because in in the way that i view neurodivergence it is much bigger than the learning difficulties and the and the different neuro processing that we inherit i also include acquired neurodivergence and things like epilepsy uh, bipolar the mental health um, spectrum um because neurodivergence is not a condition or an illness or a disorder it's an identity and i think part of a lot that's kind of going on in the community that's being driven a lot by autistic people i think but also kind of trying to encompass all types of different disabilities and different neurotypes is you know really holding on and referring back to i think it was lawrence mentioned the social model of disability and really empowering ourselves as individuals and as a community to be um, empowered in who we are and, and everything that's incredible about us. So the next slide is a picture of me when I was a little girl and I didn't know that I was autistic. Um, and I, you know, I was a very, I hold a lot of privilege. I'm a cis, white, middle-class, very bright child. Um, but you know things were different for me and i kind of you know primary school was very easy and secondary school was a whole different thing so some of my autistic challenges which i now know to be autistic challenges some of which i knew were difficult for me and some i didn't know everyone didn't experience for example so um yeah other people's talking is it literally become can become painful obviously not all the time um but yeah if i'm really overwhelmed if i'm really dysregulated i just really cannot handle anyone talking near me which is you know it's quite challenging in lots of walks of life 
My filtration of noise, smells and lights is very difficult. So I'm what they call um, sensory avoidant. So I don't, I can be very particular about smells. I can get very overwhelmed by things like that. Um, day to day, things change. I'm a very, 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 very capable human being. Um, I'm very, I have very low support needs in the sense that I don't need much assistance to kind of manage day to day. But some days I can do things and the next day I just can't. And I've really had to learn to kind of roll with that. And that's been really consistent. That was present with me from a very young age. I used to have to go to bed, you know, when I'd, I'd be put in um, leadership roles, for example, at primary school. And then I'd, you know, and then I'd sort of be bedridden for a couple of days afterwards. So that's been really threaded through my whole life. Uh, constantly, someone asked about stimming before, here it's on here, constantly fiddling, twitching to help me regulate. I used to do that in a much more kind of hidden or modified way um, because I'd obviously been conditioned that it was wrong to move in particular ways. Uh, now part of my unmasking has been allowing myself to stim more in public and be more open about that. I ran an event um, last week a forum that was all for neurodivergent disabled and chronically ill people and it was really amazing to me that I actually it got quite challenging at one point in terms of the content and I actually broke out into a kind of stimming pattern in, in that talk and that for me that's what we really that's kind of I felt so accepted and I felt so empowered to do that and I think that's really as employers and individuals and communities that's kind of what I would really love to see. Um, I can be prone to emotional outbursts and uh, they can be very intense and no amount of yoga has altered that. They have, I would say, decreased and they are less frequent, but there are certain situations that are always going to, I'm going to find the, I find it so difficult to process the emotion, emotional experience. There's one stereotype around autism is that they don't experience emotions. Well, I'm completely the opposite. It's, it's actually that you have challenges with processing emotions. So that might see, you might seem emotionless, but that may just be that you're not registering it. For me, it's that I feel emotions physically. So as you can imagine, that can be a quite an intense feeling. And that, and I find it, I, in, I sort of, um, I kind of take on everyone else's emotions that are around me. So if I'm around people who are stressed or I'm around people who are angry, then I will become that feeling, even if I'm not feeling it myself. I hate being interrupted and I have severe anxiety when I'm not in control. I find it very difficult. And all of these things have been completely present throughout my life, but oftentimes I didn't notice them or I didn't acknowledge them, or you know, I was just pigeonholed as highly strong or irrational, ridiculous. All of these kind of labels have been kind of put onto me as I have been um, growing and developing. Um, and yeah, needing to have a definite plan and not being able to relax with others close to me. So that's, you know, that's my personal experience of being autistic that I notice as my personal traits. That's kind of like, that's the stamp of me as an autistic individual. Many other autistic people will have some similarities, some links, but they may have a completely different experience. And I think it's really important to hold that, you know, if someone mentioned it, you know, once you've met one autistic person, you've met, like that is the truth. Um, me and my daughter present very, very differently. We have a common, some commonalities and we can, I understand her in particular ways, but yeah, she is very different autistic identity to mine. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Which is the Slido. So I, yeah, should be, yes. Yeah. So I don't like to talk about statistics. I find them really dull and boring, <laughs> but I think it's really important to include that in this kind of talk. So if you can join that Slido, the, um, what's that thing? Oh, it's a QR code. My brain struggles to retain words and kind of pull them out in situations, or if you can go and then whoever is in charge of the screen, it's gonna magically, produce so what percentage of autistic people autistic people are in any kind of employment and of course we know that there are there are probably quite a lot of undiagnosed autistic people around so i can't work out what's the oh yeah so okay so the top answer is people think that 51 percent of people are in employment okay and that looks like Give you a moment that looks like it stopped so the app oh, oh oh it's just changing i thought you'd all finished okay 
and the correct answer has now gone to the top. So yeah, it's 22% of autistic people. So that's a huge, you know, the stereotype of autistic people is that we're all geniuses. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of people that are not in work and that is a complete waste really. Um, and I myself, you know, as I'll talk to, you know, became out of work, directly linked to my autistic profile. Not that I knew I was autistic at the time. If we can go to the next question. So yeah, how many people were waiting for an autism, autism assessment in December 2022? And I think this is a real indicator of, um, I got my, I paid for privately for my autistic diagnosis because I, I wanted to know and I couldn't wait and I used my savings, what a privilege, and to be able to access that and, and to do that for myself. Um, because, you know, it really is, it's not just about inclusive, including these different neurotypes and neurodivergent people, we have to recognize that it's a socioeconomic um, barrier to getting diagnosed. So yeah, that is the correct answer. Let's come at the top, I think. Yeah, over, over 140,000 people are waiting. And for me, it, receiving my autism diagnosis by discovering that I was autistic was a complete um, eye-opening experience for me. And I was absolutely delighted. It was really empowering for me. So I think recognizing that the people waiting for that diagnosis need the support without that diagnosis is really important. If we go on to the, I think there's one more question. So yeah, how many times more likely will autistic people experience loneliness and isolation? And I just want to say that in working with, you know, the neurodivergent community, I think there's a misconception that um, autistic people don't want friends. Uh, humans are wired for connection. Um, so, you know, oftentimes it is uh, historic trauma, it's um, find, may find social anxiety, finding it diff difficult to access spaces. So yeah, we've gone five times. I think the answer is four times. Yeah, but yeah, it's a really high, it's a really large amount of people. So yeah, it's four times the amount of people. So we've got, um, you know, being autistic, and I've written this down because I can't remember anything. Being autistic is a mental health condition. Isn't it, sorry, it's not a mental health condition. It's a different neurotype. And people that with that neurotype are incredibly creative, interesting, engaging, and astonishing in their ability when they're allowed to thrive. If we can go back to the next slide, which is one of me, and talking a little bit about my teaching career. So I sort of find myself in this position now when, you know, I'm absolutely, um, you know, honoured and delighted to be here. And I've really um, taken control of, of the narrative around my life but and, and where I find myself today. But I think I really need to be honest and to be clear is that my vocation, what I wanted to do from when I was at school was to be a teacher. I, from a very young age, wanted to be a teacher. Well, when I was a, when I was a teenager. And... Um, I took longer to get my degree than I ought to have. I struggled getting my exams, but I was so focused on being a teacher that eventually I got there and I was offered a job at the school I trained in, in London. And because I had trained there, they had seen that I was really good at being a teacher. And I was immediately given GCSE and A-level classes, which is a kind of a sort of a badge of honor that they might not give to somebody. So I just kind of really wanted to thread that there was, the reason I'm not a teacher is not that I was not good at being a teacher. Um, I got a TLR, which I don't know what they're called anymore. I think they've changed, but yeah, you know, teaching and learning responsibility. And I had a borough wide role and I was delivering training. I was the assessment coordinator. I was focused on improving staff and pupil performance and I absolutely loved that role role and I really was thriving in one or two threads my students had great results I was an outstanding teacher I had an amazing strength in the pastoral side I had like bunches of kids in my year 10 class there were all these naughty kids but for me in my classrooms we had an amazing environment of learning not that every day was a, you know there, there were challenges within that role but I was a really really good teacher and I loved teaching and I was really passionate about it but there were certain areas of my career and certain things that I found particularly difficult so I was terrible at marking and I really struggled with having no work-life balance my weekends were a blur either off my face mostly or spent marking so I was really not regulated and I was really struggling to with the overwhelm so it would be the case of like just drinking you know 
through Friday when I, you know, to unwind or not doing that and spending the whole time marking. And, and either way was problematic for me, whatever I was doing, whether I was out dancing and drinking or whether I was at home marking, both these situations of spending the entire weekend doing one or the other thing were problematic for me. And I recognized that and I knew that this is in my twenties. Um, I was undiagnosed, I didn't know. I, I was diagnosed with mental health conditions, which is very pre pre uh, prevalent. So I, you know, I was, I had depression, although I wasn't, I was too positive to be depressed. I had anxiety, except for I could walk in and deliver an assembly or a train, you know, so there was, it never really added up, but I had these diagnoses. And so I was constantly masking. I didn't masking to even to myself. I didn't know. I had no idea I was autistic. No one had ever mentioned to me that I could be autistic at this point when I would have been at school. I don't think they even thought girls were autistic. And whilst the next logical step would have been to become an assistant head, I knew, and I've just seen this typo, which is very annoying. Um, I knew that this life was unsustainable for me. And so I went to, I have, I very luckily, one of my traits is that I don't care what people think of me necessarily. So, and I was not afraid to disclose that I was struggling. And so I went to my line manager or my head teacher, I can't remember who specifically was the first person I had a conversation with. And I said like, look, I know I'm doing really well in these areas. Like everyone knows I'm terrible at marking, you know, you know there's those kind of things. And, and I think Lawrence was talking about, you know, being on performance management and kind of capability procedures. You know, I was nowhere near going on capabilities at all, but, you know, given some time, the marking was always going to be an issue, which is, you know, and, you know, assessments and those kind of things. So, yeah, I kind of went and I said, like, look, this is not working for me. I, you know, I'm really struggling with the, the level of work. It's not the, it's not the um, cognitive level of work, it's not the challenge of the work, but it's the amount of work. It's the amount of time I'm expected to be here. So please, can I go down to four days? So obviously I had to go to occupational therapy um, to be assessed. And they said, yeah, you know, this, you know, she's obviously struggling with her mental health. Um, yeah, that's, you know, we can do that. And in the process of this, I obviously asked for, you know, this consideration, this accommodation, and was not given that accommodation and so in that process I um, thought about it for about a second and <laughs> quit because for me it was so black and white because I'm autistic which is you know for me a, you know an amazing amazing quality people said I was so brave and I was like well, I'm not brave it just doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense for me to continue working in an environment that's not working for me because no, no matter that I'm a good teacher no matter that my classes are successful no matter that children are learning no matter that this has been my vocation for my whole entire life like it's not working for me and I can see that this is going to result in me having a breakdown I'd already had a breakdown when I was 20 which one of the things about the neurodivergent experience is that, um, you know, breakdowns can come in very, you know, different ways. But essentially, I moved to Germany. I've been through some challenging life experiences. I went to Germany. I was constantly masking and just slowly, 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 I became so overwhelmed that it led to, you know, a, a sort of a mental health breakdown, as, as I would have called it then. Now I just see it was a complete burnout, autistic burnout experience. You know, this is, so that's where the kind of like the language thing is kind of, you know, useful and interesting because it redefines what our experience is so I'd already yeah I already knew that I'd had this kind of breakdown and I was there was no way that I wanted to ever get in that situation ever again so I left a job that I was really good at that I was really thriving at that I was really I was earning good money I was you know I had a nice flat but I didn't want to go down that road towards having a breakdown and so I left now I'm sure there could have I could have done lots of things and and gone to the union and all those kind of things but I'm I have a very demand avoidant profile which means that I just can't be bothered so I left and I've made a pathway from that moment to where I am now today and I'm very happy where I am now today but one thing I really think it's important to know and one of that that loneliness and isolation stuff is this photo is, is from the time when I was I was a teacher and I was in my flat and the thing that I really noticed, I was going through like my Facebook, you know, looking for photos. And in every single photo, I'm with someone, I'm with a friend, I'm with a colleague. And it really, really reminded me that that period of my, of my teaching career was the most connected 
and the most supported and the most part of a community that I have ever felt. And since that I left that teaching job, I have experienced much more isolation, much more disconnection, much more feelings of um, sadness about my life experience. Because in leaving that job, I didn't just leave you know, my career, I left all of the internal supports and whatever you say around teaching and, you know, and teachers and the, the experience of being in education, like there is a real sense of collective and English teachers also have a particular um, kind of collective sense. Can someone turn that off? That's really distracting. Um, and yeah, so I, you know, uh, right. I'm just gonna wait and regather my thoughts. And so even doing things like that, little small mechanisms that I have learned, that's about me being empowered as an autistic person. I would have just tried to carry on and pretend that everything was okay. I would have masked that. I would have thought I cannot show that this noise has interrupted me and it's put me off my thought. So now I know that I'm autistic and I know that I have issues with interruptions and noises and things like that. It's much easier for me to empower, be empowered to do that, to advocate for myself. Because being a neurodivergent advocate is not just about for my child, it's not just about for my clients, it's also for myself and situations that I walk into. And I have created a life where that's possible for me, but I'm, I absolutely fundamentally know that that's not the case for many, many folks who are in that community who identify as neurodivergent, whether that's autistic, whether that's mental health diagnosis, whether it's PTSD, whether it's dyslexia. And I think the more conversations we have around this, the better that we will be. I've gone completely off what I was gonna say, but I think that was important to recognize. So yeah, this was a period, my teaching career was a period of time where I was my most connected, but also where I was struggling the most. And really, I think the important thing for me when we talk about accommodations is there was nothing about me that made me not be able to be a teacher. It was the environment and the way that the environment was created and the expectations of what I was supposed to do above and beyond when I wasn't at school. If I'd been asked to work five days a week and that was it, there was no take home, I could have carried on in that job. But with the take home work that a teacher had specifically, I needed to work four days a week because I couldn't do it all. And all that it was leading me to do was to self-medicate through drinking, or be so stressed and overworked that I had no life. And I couldn't, I was oscillating between these two, you know, almost like weekend to weekend. And I think it's really important when we talk about it as managers and we're thinking about what's happening in work is the impact that it has outside of work. And that's what you will notice as a parent if you have a, a neurodivergent child. Like my daughter is fine in school, she's fine. And then she comes home, she brings it all home. And that's what workers do. That's what grown-ups do. They do exactly the same. They go into school, they uh, all work, sorry. <laughs> adults go into work, children go into school. Well, some adults go into school, but you know what I mean. And they mask. They pretend that everything's okay because they've been conditioned to do that from a very young age because they have been told that there is something inherently wrong with them. And I think that's really important with anyone who has a neurodivergent condition is we have been told that we, there is something wrong with us, whether that's explicitly or implicitly. Moving on, I feel like I've got on a bit of a roll there, so sorry. Not sorry, but you know. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. This, so this is just the picture of me, uh, a vision of my life and what's so amazing about being who I am and everything about me is that I have managed to somehow create a life that works for me and it works for my daughter there's my daughter that's we're wearing our sunflower badges as we've gone uh, out for the day there's absolutely there's nothing that my daughter cannot do there's nothing that I cannot do but we really have to modify and accommodate our mutual needs to be able to do anything so we for example I would never ever ever at this point go on a day out with her with anybody else with any other family because she needs my undivided attention and I need to be able to give that to her so it's not just that she needs my attention it's because I'm autistic and my processing is difficult I can't handle being with other people and having conversations at the same time so we really have developed and worked out between us and she's six but we're co-creating that and we're understanding that and she is so empowered in her autistic identity and her ADHD identity that you know I really really hope that she won't face the same challenges that you know that I did and that many other adults are facing today 
the work I do speaking to people like yourselves through the Speakers Collective and um, the work that I'm starting to do in my community around Thane is something that gives me such great hope and such great positivity for the future. I think it's absolutely vital that we all come together, not just the neurodivergent people, but everybody you know, around them, which I know everyone who's here today is already kind of on that page. But yeah, and also then just doing yoga teaching and being part of that movement. And I really, 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 really encourage anyone who has any, it doesn't have to be yoga, but that kind of neurodivergent support, uh, exercise is something that really repels me. Um, but yoga, movement, being in our body is that regulation piece that is really, um, I think goes sometimes goes unrecognized the amount of stress and the amount of pressure that neurodivergent people can be under to try and keep up in the neurotypical world. And so using things like yoga, dance, movement, um, music, things like that, that just allow you to be in your body um, are just so, it's so, so very helpful for in general for, I mean, for all humans. Again, I think John referenced it, you know, that the things for dyslexia are good for everybody it's the same for neurodivergent you know for any autistic people anyone um last slide please i've just seen i love yoga too yeah i mean it's amazing i would prescribe it if i could to the whole world <laughs> and we would be in a lot in a big a very different situation um so what can you do to support neurodivergent folk I very specifically have not offered you a list of things that you can do because i really want to um be mindful of the fact that like what i think is a good accommodation may not be something that or not that you know somebody else might think and so the first bullet point that i put is listen people want to be heard the when i create spaces where people come and share their experience and what i hear time and time again whether that's with parents of neurodivergent people oftentimes who are neurodivergent themselves whether that's a for, you know like a public forum like i was in yet last week you know, people just want to be heard and they have been put down, they have been mistreated, they have had trauma that has been unrecognized. And I use trauma there with like a small T because, you know, you, you know, we often think of, you know, trauma as being, you know, a car crash, you know, her a horrific, you know, big event, but actually the lived experience of neurodivergent people and, and you know, other people have, can have that too. But if you think about the sensory processing challenges, that are inherent as part of the neurodivergent condition and the fact that we're constantly trying to shoehorn ourselves into a world that's not made for us. There's a sense of trauma, you know, just day to day. That's when my, when my daughter comes home and has a massive meltdown, I know that that's what sometimes it's nothing specific has happened, is literally just simply what she has been holding onto throughout the course of the day. So when I would be at work and I would just go, uh, and go, you know, go to the pub on Friday and get and drink my face off. You know, that was just me just being overwhelmed from the trauma of just being in that environment and it just being too much for me to handle. I couldn't titrate it, I couldn't filter it out. So, really, just listen to people and what their experience is. Acceptance, understanding, and compassion. I mean, I think we're making great steps towards that, but I also think we have to acknowledge and we have to recognize that most of our institutions are not set up in accepting, understanding and compassionate ways. I don't think that from the top down, from the way, you know, the way that society is organized and through our institutions, I don't think that, you know, it's everything is so performance driven. So it's very, very hard to be truly accepting, understanding and compassionate when you've got targets to meet. There's a time effort, there's a labor, um, it's, you know, it can be labor intensive to put in accommodations and supports. But I think the more that we do that and we try to do that, the better that not just the neurodivergent experiences, but the, the whole of humanity's experience is. Um, and I've written here, you know, like we are not ridiculous. <laughs> Our lives are, can be really painful. And I think that's, that's speaking to my experience. That's definitely what I felt because I carried so much privilege and I've always been very successful in inverted commas. And that people I don't just were like, what's your problem? You know, and I think I didn't know. I was like, I don't know what my problem is, but like I've got a really big problem and I'm, I'm struggling and I don't know what to do about it. And I just wasn't met with that level of accommodation and understanding and compassion that I needed. Um, accommodations take time. We have to be empowered to, uh, um, to ask for those accommodations and to get and to, to, to recognize what they are. A lot of the neurodivergent community don't even know what they need. 
because they've ne- they've been told so much that they are not allowed to have what they need. So they've kind of disconnected and they've disassociated from what they actually need. So I think the process of listening then leads to the correct accommodations. Um, inclusion is bigger than just about us. We have to, you know, put that into the framework of, you know, doing the work, all of the work, you know, for with all kinds of disabilities, anti-racism work, all of this work kind of feeds into each other. That's what I'm really noticing. And now as being part of the, you know, this community interest company and working in the community and connecting with other organizations. It's just how inaccessible the world is in, in so many different ways to so many different people and really, you know, working as allies to help include people. Um, and the final point that I've put is celebration. The self-worth of so many neurodivergent people is so low. It's like on the floor a lot of times, you know, and that can be teenagers all the way up to like 45, 50, you know, people in their, in their, in their pension. Even I know a lady who's diagnosed with autism, I think 72, you know, and she really, you know, we go through our lives and we are, so, we are conditioned to believe that we are, you know, inherently there's something wrong with us. And so the more we can celebrate the achievements of ourselves as neurodivergent people, but also that that is celebrated in the workplace. And I think if you put the right accommodations in place, then we can celebrate the strengths and the talents of the neurodivergent people that are working in our communities. Um, And I just really like wanting to sort of like end with just a really small story. Like we, neurodivergent people, we seek each other out. We know know where we are with each other. And I was on the train um, going up to a talk in Lancaster and a, a girl just started talking to me about her Pokemon collection. Now this, I don't know what her story was, I've never met her before, but it was very clear to me that she was neurodivergent in some way. And I don't really remember if it was Pokemon or not, but I just engaged with her and chatted to her and she told me all about the different you know, things and went through them. And what I really, really remember is that connection. And it was so interesting because actually another man on the train witnessed this conversation. And, and as I was getting off the train, I sort of said goodbye. He was like, that was really lovely what you did for that girl. And I was like, oh, like it didn't, you know, I was like, oh, what do you mean? Like that I engaged with her. And he was like, yeah, it was just really nice. And I think that's what it really stuck in my mind, you know, in that for many, many, you know, that isolation piece, that loneliness piece is that that's what people don't get. They don't get set, they don't get their interests, their the things that they love, the qualities that are good about them. They don't, they're not celebrated, whether that's at school, whether that's in the family context, whether that's mm-hmm. in the workplace. Can people turn off their microphones, please? And um yeah. So, Did you go okay? Brill, all lovely. I really appreciate it. So yeah, so just celebrate and just, I'm just going to celebrate the fact that that was really awkward for me and I've just made, it's just made me laugh. And so don't worry, whoever that was. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Um, I've said loads of things I didn't mean to, and I've missed some things out, but I hope that that has covered more or less the the kind of the breadth of what I wanted to say. Thank you so much to our hosts for organizing it. It's been really, really lovely behind the scenes to be a part of this. And so, yeah, thank you very much. I can't remember who I'm going back to. Oh, that's my last slide. This is me. This is where you can find me. Um, Yeah, I'm on Instagram and uh, I have a website and I work through the Speakers Collective. So that's how I know John. Um, And uh, yeah, that was, it was lovely to speak to you. And you can just see, I I don't know, but this is part of, it's like my brain is just like, right, it's gone now. See ya. So thank you very much. Holly, thank you very much. And uh, again, another very different kind of insight. And just really thank you for sharing your kind of reality. I think we we sometimes talk about people's stories and I don't personally, I don't like to call them stories because they're not stories, they're people's lives. So again, everybody on the call, thank you. So we are about to go into short breakout sessions now. So you will, I understand, be automatically connected into that room. And what we're asking you to do, and it's going to be for no more than 15 minutes, for you to have some initial reflections on what you've heard today, how that might have impacted you on a personal level. But more importantly, we'd ask you to nominate a spokesperson who can share back any of the group's reflections and make a note of any questions that you'd ask Lawrence. John or Holly. So 
I'm going to hand over now to whoever takes us into the breakout room and there will be time for us to thank collectively the three guest speakers who I think have just been fantastic. So thank you very much. Have we got everybody back in the room now? Yeah, I think so. It looks like Mark, we might have lost a few people along the way, but yeah, breakout to close everyone back. Brilliant. Okay then, so I'm obviously not going to know who's feeding back from every group, but we are now going to ask if the agreed sports people can just provide some summary of what people's reflections were and then pause any questions. So, Emma, I'm going to apologise because I know that you did it for <laughs> <our group. laughs> That's no problem. Thanks very much, Mark. Turn um, my phone off. Um, so the first reflection was um, with that a good few of us had joined because we um, work in an environment where we're not, uh, we don't, uh, that there's a, a lack of understanding of what neuro, being neurodivergent means. So it was really good to see, particularly Marshall is an HR manager to come in and try and get some real understanding about what that means for, um, for our colleagues and everyone in general, I think. Um, it's very empowering. Um, we had someone talking about um, work from workforce development and public health, looking at how it's really important to uh, have that prior understanding for certain workplace students that are just coming in for a very short period of time, so a couple of weeks on a placement, and being able to support those students properly for the, the for the short period of time that they're there. So it's just common sense in understanding what people, I mean, we're all different, but there are certain um, challenges or, or difficulties. If we, we create, create those difficulties, it's about moving those boundaries and hurdles so that those difficulties just aren't there. Um, creating active staff networks so that we are, and, and again, really inclusive of the neurodivergent people. So it's not led by neurotypicals as well. I think that's really important. Um, I mentioned the stigma, the mental health impact that, that being neurodivergent because of the ableist society that we're in has on, on neurodivergent people, um, particularly the talk that John gave on dyslexia really resonated. Um, it's interesting to see how many people are diagnosed so late, but I think that's indicative of our society at the moment and hopefully that will change despite, and I'm well aware of this, the um, waiting times. Um, in terms of questions that we had back, I, I wondered how we actually do get re, uh, proper buy-in from senior managers. I mean, the, the most senior, I'm, I'm from the NHS, NHS England, where we're not just, where we're actually making those um, tangible changes uh, at, a, at a senior level and that we, um, that, that becomes good employment practice. And as Mark said, that's not just about for people who are neuro neurodivergent, that's for everyone understanding everyone and everyone's differences and where we need to be, be accommodating as, as far as we, we can and finally just for me I think that um, we shouldn't be afraid to ch challenge the rules that we have and that's it thank you Emma so Christina do we want to or take the question now or wait until everybody's had the chance to ask the questions I'd say go for it, Mark. There's questions particularly from that group, but I'd open up if everyone's comfortable yeah. with that. So, so I'll probably start then, because the question that we got from the group was around how do we make sure senior managers can uh, take action? And there's something for me about, so as a senior manager, because I report directly to the corporate director, it's around the personal action that I'm going to take back in Kent to kind of role model the kind of thing I want to be, but also to encourage people to be the change they want to see, because sometimes it's, it's not going to happen because of one senior leader or a group of senior leaders. It's going to happen if everybody becomes part of the change they expect to see and not wait for it to happen. So this is part of my summary at the end. So I'll kind of pause it there and see if any of the other kind of speakers wants to add anything into that. Maybe just to add, um, uh, and I agree completely with Mark with what you've said. Um, I think change at a senior management level usually happens because of one of three things. Um, 
it's either because something really goes quite wrong. Let's say the organization loses an employment tribunal case or there's some adverse press reaction. Um, and that's really not the stage anyone wants to get to um, because it means that something has really failed at that organization. Um, sometimes you, you do get a senior management management member who has got a personal connection and they might be neurodivergent themselves they might have a, a family member and and sometimes change can be driven through by above but to be most meaningful as mark says it has to come up and um, and so for what whatever your networks are and um, for your organizations and um, making sure that the message is spread that this is something that's relevant to everyone um, is really important. And as a trade unionist would always say, um, that the most effective means of getting that collective action um, is through the independent um, employee organisations and through the trade unions as well. Anybody else to add anything or do we go to the next group? Let's go to the next group then. Who wants to come in? Because I don't know who was in the other groups. I don't mind feeding back from our group. Thank you. Um, so the conversations we had, um, so I suppose the first one is a question. We were all, um, it was great to hear the stories of the individuals, but we were wondering is if there were things that could have been done differently, what would be the advice on that? So to take Holly's story, is there something that could have been put in place which would have enabled it to continue? And if that was the case, what would that be? We had a, a, a quite a long conversation about application processes for jobs and how those could be made sim simpler and what people were describing the work they're doing on that. There was a point around occupational health assessments and whether people within that should be better trained in neurodiversity and whether that would be a good place for people to understand more. So that was another conversation. Um, and my particular question, because I'm a non-executive director is, obviously I'm not day-to-day -to -day managing the organization. I'm, you know, um, how can I have assurance that my organisation is doing everything it possibly can to make it inclusive for, for everybody? Um, we had a bit of a conversation and there was, Emma helpfully described some of the work she's doing about networks and how potentially I could understand who the chairs of those groups are and how they feed into processes. So that was some of the debate we had. Thank you very much, Joanne. And have you, could people in the groups, because I think some of the questions will be difficult to answer in the time that we've got available. So it might be helpful if people could make a note of any of the charts, email them in, however you see fit, because I think there are some questions that you've posed, Joanne, about the, the how do you fulfill your role? So I think some of them will require a, a probably a further, more considered answer. But Holly, I don't wish to put you on the spot, but Joanne did ask a very particular question. I didn't know if you wanted to answer that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it, uh, you know, from my perspective, it would have been very, very easy. I wanted to continue in my job. I was, you know, tracking very well in lots of areas. And what I asked essentially was just to go down to four days a week so that I could take off the load and essentially do all my marking and planning on that sort of fifth day. But of course, in um, the context of teaching, um, they don't want, I mean, re re in reality, people don't want teachers to be working part time. There's a precedence that people who have young children are allowed to, you know, share their timetable and split that. So actually what they offered me was that I was allowed to go to four days a week um, because I've been to occupational health and there had been a recommendation. So they did say you're allowed to go to four days a week, but you will lose 20 percent of your pay. And uh, you will be expected to teach the same amount of classes over the four days. So mathematically, that didn't make any sense because I would be doing the same amount of work 
in less time. So I would have had more things to do. So essentially how it would have been is, is had they listened to me and if it wasn't feasible to, you know, to give me what I wanted, and obviously there was no conversation around that. There was like, you know, it was like, you've asked us for this. We're going to go away. We'll come back. We'll tell you, you know, what you can have which was a no brainer. And I, I definitely, I, they, I don't think they ever expected me to take that offer. I think they just expected me to carry on working five days a week for my hundred percent of my pay. So I think really it would have been a conversation, you know, like, you know, because it's very, very difficult to, you know, everyone's needs have to be met. It's a dialogue, you know, it has to be, there has to be a reciprocity within the experience, you know, and I don't think what I was asking for wasn't, um, I, I had identified what I needed and I was told what I could have, but they were, and, then it, and they didn't match up. And that, that was the end of the conversation. Do you know what I mean? So it was kind of that sense of like, just being open. And I think being hurt, like listening, you know, that's why I put listening, you know, because that's really, um, you know, for me, the fundamental. So I hope that's answered your question. Um, I am particularly unusual that I know exactly what I need. Most people, most people are not that clear on knowing exactly what they need, but I, you know, that's one of my, you know, things that I can really highlight. So I think for most people, they probably wouldn't come and say, I want this. They might come and say, I'm really struggling, you know, and have opening that conversation and, and being open to support them in ways that they can. Thank you, Holly. And thank you for sharing that. So. Just conscious of time, I, if we can probably take feedback from one more group only, and then if people who haven't had the chance to speak and pop any reflections or questions in the chat, because I do want to finish on time. I can present for my team. Um, we echoed a lot of the feedback already but we sort of said we found the life experiences of the speakers discussed very thought provoking and reflective including in relation to ourselves so there's few people in our group who discussed like myself who had dyslexia and how this has made them think about that um, or they've got children um, or people they work with so we, we had a discussion around that side of things but we sort of also discussed how we as either employees or even colleagues can assist either existing workers or new workers and encourage new workers into the services um because we discussed that with from different backgrounds health and social care um, and what sort of adaptations we could make and we had a bit of a chat about realistic adaptations you know it, what we can and can't do um so yeah we had a good discussion about that sort of things including about the late or no diagnosis as that was discussed in the presentation thank you graham was there a particular question that you had for any of the panel members in the couple of minutes that we've got left before i wrap up or the group had we didn't really come up with any questions we more discussed how we found the session and what it got us thinking about in terms of ourselves and going forward um, no one really identified sort of any burning questions, just sort of a general view that all the service was, could do with sort of training on this topic and, you know, maybe more in-depth training on each individual, you know, aspect, you know, like autism, dyslexia, whatnot. We all sort of discussed and felt that could have been beneficial, but no burning questions. Thank you, Graham. So just, again, conscious of time, I'm just going to kind of close today's sessions and... I'm not going to be able to do any justice to everything that I've heard all morning and that we've all collectively heard. So I think as always, we thank the people not by name because I'll forget somebody because I'm rubbish with names unless they're in front of me who've pulled this session together. It looks really slick when you're in the room, but a massive amount of work goes in for weeks, for months. So thank you very much to everybody that has helped pull this together. I'd like to say personally, I think I've heard for some very inspirational people. I think they've shared their realities. I think one of the things I would ask all organisations to do is stop calling them stories because stories are things you read in books. These are people's lives. And I challenge my own organisation to not call them stories. These are people's lived realities. And I think one of the strongest things is regardless of how people present in person, we never know what's going on underneath the surface. And Holly, you said something that I really connect with is because you know me on Tuesday doesn't mean you know me on Wednesday. And if you know me on Tuesday morning, 
It doesn't mean you normally choose the afternoon. It's whatever's going on in the background will massively affect that. So I think that's really important. I'd like to think we already knew the case for inclusion was clear, but if we were in doubt, I think today's session clearly says it's an absolute no-brainer. If we had an organisation of divergent thought, and this is about people with neurodiversity, it's about people from ethnically diverse communities, people that identify from anywhere, we're just going to be a fantastic organisation and we're ultimately going to be the best for the people that we're ultimately serving, which is what we're here about. So I think definitely you've heard today that everybody is unique and everybody has a very unique kind of world view. And the take home really is you, you can't, you met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. I think that was loud and clear. And it would be the same for somebody with dyslexia and so on and so on. I think the sad thing is legislation isn't enough. We've got laws, we've had laws for years, but it's about people taking personal action. This, this is about the culture change that we want. So we could change the law tomorrow and all the things we've talked about in terms of challenges would continue. And it changes because people define that change and they become the change that they want to be. And I just think it's been a fantastic morning. It's the start of an ongoing conversation. Holly, we're definitely going to connect out of here and I will come down to Margate to come and see you. And we will have conversations about what's going on in Kent. And just, there's a hundred and odd people on this call or there were at the start. So between you take that collective action and what you do amplifies it with somebody else. So that one person becomes two, becomes three, becomes four. And managers can't ignore that. So I've got my job to do at a senior level. But I can't get anywhere near 3,000 staff. I've no idea what's going on for them. So I have to kind of take some direct action on the back of this. So just thank you very much, everybody. I've loved this morning and... For people who are on the call, can you please follow the, was there a slide or popped in the chat with the access to the feedback form? And my last bit would be, I appreciate there are neurodivergent people in the audience as well as speakers, and I appreciate that it's a lot of information to process. The video will be available, sorry, the, yeah, the recording video will be available, so please, that will come out. And you'll have the time to kind of like follow up after the session. So thank you very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure.